one of the most terrible sights in history. The Panzer Drive that ripped through the Maginot Line and took Paris in 40 days. 40 days! But the military authorities had said that this was impossible. At such speed, a mechanized army would outrun its supplies and be stranded. But the Nazis did not outrun their supplies. Why? Because right behind the Panzers came the German engineers, throwing bridges over rivers, laying roads for the supply trucks, keeping their machines constantly fed. For the French armies, the end was death. For the British, Dunkirk. And the Nazis boasted, we will keep what we have won. Our engineers will fortify this coast so that no nation will ever be able to land a mechanized army on Fortress Europa. But this time, the Nazis were mistaken. Among the men who were to prove them wrong were the Navy-created Seabees, seagoing constructioneers whose answer always is can do. Under the direction of the Civil Engineer Corps, they were to build and fight all over the world, in the Atlantic, the Pacific, against Germans, against Japs. These men were recruited from American workmen, expert mechanics, carpenters, factory foremen, the men who had built America. They were not all young men. When the Marines first saw some of these old timers, they said, never hit a CB, his grandson might be a Marine. Many were boys who had built their own radio sets and made their own jalopies out of spare parts. But now these kids had to do infinitely more than take apart a motor. They had to help take apart Germany's defenses. That meant rigorous training, for these men had to learn to fight as well as to build. These were the men the Navy was depending on to build the huge invasion bases, to invent some means for landing tons of material on enemy beaches under fire to keep more supplies moving across water and through surf than the Germans could keep moving across roads, to start these supplies flowing within minutes after the first assault waves landed. Their first job was typically tough, typically urgent. In the British Isles, harbors were choked with crippled ships. These ships had to be repaired quickly, put back into action. In little old seaport towns like Londonderry and Roseneath, the first contingent was landed. A modern fighting construction corps thrust into an old world atmosphere. Right away, the Yankee construction crews were confronted with uh, traffic problems. But neither beef nor beefing could stop them. They broke up the old world atmosphere although the Luftwaffe was breaking it up a good deal more. New camps began to spring up. In great secrecy, work on repair bases for the crippled fleet had already been started by civilian construction crews working under the direction of officers of the Civil Engineer Corps. The newly arrived units threw all their energies to rush to completion the docks, warehouses, and machine shops at these bases. American factories were turning out machines on day and night schedules. Into these machines went the fuel denied American pleasure drivers. Out of them came a new fleet, built from ships the Germans thought were flop houses for fishes. To refuel the six to eight ships that were docking every day, men from Texas and Oklahoma threw miles of pipeline across swampy, rocky country. To store the oil, they constructed tank farms covering acres with large steel tanks. In America, such tanks were built by bolting the steel plates together. Here, some of the plates had to be welded. But there were some of the men who used to be welders. They taught the others. Then it was found each tank had to have a brick wall for protection against bomb fragments. Two of the men turned out to be ex-bricklayers. They showed the others how it was done. In seven months, more repair work was done than the old established yards had turned out during the entire First World War. Here is a typical base repair job. A destroyer on submarine patrol is caught by Stukas, 
she limps away, trailing smoke and leaking badly. Her distress signal is picked up by a newly completed radio station. When the destroyer reaches the repair docks, ambulances of the medical corps are waiting to take off the wounded. The injured are rushed to a hospital at the base. There, doctors are standing by, ready for an emergency operation. You are watching an actual operation performed on a few minutes' notice in the Londonderry Hospital. Meanwhile, Navy repair crews are swarming over the ship. Thanks to American skill, the destroyer was repaired between tides and returned to action the same day. Seabees worked with these repair crews. Several remarkable records were set up. They changed the propeller of the USS Greer in a few hours. Shortly afterward, they fitted out the USS Williamsburg with new propeller shafts, turn tubes, and bearings. The Canadian Corvette Calgary had all the bearings in her main engines replaced at the same time, a feat never before accomplished. Said General Patch, It has been a constant wonder to me how the CBs could possess so many skills and do such a huge amount and variety of work. While this work, a defensive fighting measure, went on, the Germans were moving through Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Crete, northern Africa, and half of Russia. The first break came on the desert at El Alamein. Marshal Rommel's forces were defeated, and the Germans were thrown out of Africa. At last, we had bases from which to launch an offensive against the Axis Europe at the soft underbelly of Sicily and Italy. Compared to the Atlantic Wall, this was indeed the soft underbelly. But powerful shore batteries protected the combined German and Italian armies. With the barriers were strong natural defenses. The worst of these were long shelving beaches. The Axis counted heavily on these beaches. The Allies landing craft will ground in the shallow water a hundred yards from shore. Men perhaps can swim to the beach, but the enemy can't swim tanks, heavy trucks or artillery. Our shore batteries can pick off their grounded landing craft like sitting ducks. These beaches are practically invincible. In London, the Allied Supreme Council met to consider the problem of the invincible beaches. They debated every way of unloading the LSTs rapidly. Unless the landing force could get tanks and artillery ashore quickly, the beachhead would be wiped out. It would be Dieppe and Dunkirk all over again. It was an extremely difficult problem. But the Navy's pontoon causeway development offered a possible solution. There was an officer in the Navy Civil Engineer Corps named Captain John N. Laycock, who, even before the war, had everybody in his office saving cigar boxes for him. And from a study of these boxes came one of the most important developments of the war. Here are models of this development. The Navy's pontoon, designed to stand a terrific strain. Fasten 50 of these boxes together, and you have a barge. Pile other boxes on the sides of the barge, and you have a floating dry dock. Secure three strings of them side by side, and you have a floating causeway that could bridge the distance from a stranded LST to the shore. The little model boxes worked perfectly, but how would the real boxes work under shell fire on enemy beaches? With a top secret classification, steel boxes were built. The CBs experimented with the boxes, found they worked. They called their pontoons the Jeep of the CBs. But learning to handle the floating boxes was a whole new art. Learning to ride them in a heavy sea, a brand new way to get killed, unless you knew how. They had to find out the hard way. There was no book of directions. They weren't learning a new form of warfare. They were inventing it. Finally, the pontoon crews were given their orders. From bases in Scotland, they and their steel boxes were secretly embarked for North Africa. For the first time, these skilled workmen were to go under fire in the European area. They had boasted that they could protect what they built, 
well, they would get a chance to prove it. In Tunisia, they went ashore to prepare for the first invasion of Axis Europe. The boys who had driven jalopies down Main Street and beach wagons in Londonderry were a long, long way from home now. The British Isles had seemed a little old-fashioned, but at least the English had heard of the automobile. No wonder the Germans had seemed like supermen to the Tunisians. They just didn't know the Americans. In the port of Bizerte, a great invasion fleet was being assembled. Plans were going forward. Aerial reconnaissance reported that the enemy strength was being concentrated in northern Sicily. The southern coast was only lightly held. The German generals evidently believed that 500 feet of shallow water would stop an invasion as surely as a 500-foot wall. The brass hats decided to hit the southern beaches and trust to the Navy's pontoons. The men had a few weeks to complete their experiments. The original plan had been to tow the pontoons behind the LSTs, but the naval officers were afraid that this would slow down the landing craft too much. But as usual, changes were quickly made that would do the trick. A way was devised for hanging the pontoons from the sides of the LSTs. Next, the Army engineers objected that a pontoon long enough to reach the shore could not be kept rigid. In heavy surf, it would sway too much for trucks and tanks to be driven across it. This objection was solved by using two pontoons, slightly overlapping, one extending beyond the other like a slide rule. Thus, each pontoon reinforced the other. The day before the invasion of Sicily, the world had waited three years to see this fleet set sail, the fleet that was to strike the first blow at Axis Europe. It had taken weeks to build the earthen causeways over which hundreds of tanks and trucks were loaded on LSTs. Unloading in Sicily was to be done on the pontoons secured now on the sides of the LSTs. Everything was ready for the big show. At dawn, the fleet stood out to sea. This was it, one of the decisive undertakings of the war. A successful landing in Sicily would mean the virtual end of Mussolini's power. The German military authorities had assured Il Duce that a landing in Sicily was impossible. The Germans were right, as far as an ordinary invasion fleet was concerned. They just hadn't heard about the Navy's pontoons. Sicily. As the landing craft charged the beach, the shore batteries opened up. The German and Italian officers must have thought the Americans had gone crazy or had lost their sounding charts. As the landing craft came closer to the shoaling water, crews cast off all but two cables with trip hooks holding the pontoons. The water was shoaling fast. The LSTs dropped their ramps. Below decks, the order was given to start the tank engines. In the chart room, the soundings were checked off. In a few minutes, the ships would ground. Pontoons away. For a few moments, the LSTs towed the pontoons with the CB crews aboard. Then the ships grounded. The pontoons surged forward, carried by their own momentum. In a matter of seconds, their crews had guided them into place. Before the astonished Germans and Italians could recover, waves of tanks, guns, and men were coming ashore across the pontoons. The impossible had been accomplished. The next strike was at Salerno, the first blow at the mainland of Europe. This time, the Germans knew all about the pontoons and were ready to handle them. The Italian troops guarding the shallow water beaches at Salerno were reinforced by the crack 16 panzers. Big guns had been installed on the cliffs 
Stukas and Falk Wolfs stood ready at the landing fields. All received the same orders. When the landing comes, get those for damn Yankee pantoons. The minute the German guns opened up, everybody knew this was going to be different from Sicily. But the LST still came on. The first men had already hit the beach. Unless support could be gotten to them, they'd never leave it. The pontoons were launched. On the open rafts, the men were as exposed as frogs on a flat rock. Then the Stukas came down on them. The planes concentrated on the LSTs and the loaded causeways. Many of the 300 CBs riding the pontoons were killed. 42 were awarded the Purple Heart. German bombs and shells wrecked some of the pontoons, but the steel boxes were all interchangeable, and new ones were substituted. The flow of trucks and tanks was never interrupted for more than a few minutes. A CB-operated bulldozer had the honor of being the first invasion vehicle to land in Europe. In spite of one of the worst bombardments in history, the Navy and Coast Guard brought in 190 LSTs. They were unloaded. The Germans fell back and the Salerno beachhead had been taken. The whole world knew the next attack must come against the west coast of Europe, against the Atlantic Wall, one of the greatest engineering projects in history. The Germans had good reason to believe that we could never land a mechanized army against such defenses as these. That would mean landing more supplies here in two months without any docking facilities that were landed during the entire First World War with the use of all the Atlantic harbors. Yet, if these fortifications fell, Germany must fall. Plans for the invasion began in 1943 at the Quebec Conference. It was decided that at least 12,000 tons of supplies and 2,500 vehicles per day would have to be landed to support our attacking forces. This was more than all the French ports could have handled even in time of peace. For strategic reasons, the Bay of the Seine was selected for the landing. But the Bay of the Seine has a 21-foot tide. That meant any causeways usable at low tide would be underwater at high. There was also a stiff tidal current that would carry away any ordinary floating bridge. And also there were sandbanks that made shipping almost impossible. The German fortifications were particularly strong here. The conference did not attempt to solve these problems. They simply outlined the broad policy and left the details to the engineers. Immediately, preparations began to launch the invasion, one of the most gigantic operations ever undertaken by man. Enormous bases were built along the south coast of England, Exeter, Plymouth, Dartmouth, Talmouth, Forey, Salcombe, Tainmouth, and many others. But the bases were only incidental to the incredible engineering project underway. While the world waited, work went on in the utmost secrecy throughout the autumn of 43 and the spring of 44. Every day, flights of planes passed over the yards on their way to hammer the Atlantic Wall. Troops were shunted from all parts of England toward the docks. The great transports began to unload at Plymouth and Southampton. Something was getting ready to break. This program has been interrupted to bring you a news flash. London, the invasion of Europe has begun. After days of savage fighting, the Germans fell back from the coast. But according to plan before they retreated, train loads of explosives were driven onto the great wharves at Cherbourg, Le Havre, Brest. Then... 
In a few minutes, the work of a generation of French architects and engineers was wiped out. The famous pier at Cherbourg, where the Normandy used to dock in peacetime, was ripped apart. The wharves at Le Havre were turned into rubble. It would take months to repair the destruction, if it could ever be repaired. The Germans, thinking our invasion force had been cut off, counterattacked. In Berlin, Goebbels shouted this would be the greatest disaster in British and American history. The German reserves, held in readiness for months, were thrown in. They were told that the invasion force had been cut off from all supplies. Even building a breakwater to protect our cargo ships would take months. The Allies had anticipated the destruction of harbors. So in the months before D-Day, a great fleet had been assembled along the English coast, the strangest fleet that ever put to sea. Giant floating cement blocks, each literally as big as a house, stood ready in the harbors. These blocks, called Phoenixes, were a British innovation. Each had its own specially trained CB towing crew. Every Phoenix was divided into compartments equipped with sea valves, so it could be sunk in a few minutes. By sinking 20 or 40 of these blocks end to end, an enormous breakwater would be formed in a few hours. To protect the Phoenixes from attack, each of the cement blocks had a 40 millimeter gun mounted on top, manned by an army crew. Once the Phoenix was sunk, it instantly became not only a part of the breakwater, but also a fort. Towed by tugs, this incredible armada began to cross the channel the morning of D-Day. The towing crews stood by the tow lines constantly. A sudden plunge of the cement mountains could snap the towing cables like twine. No one but a seaman can realize the difficulty of towing these heavy, plunging concrete giants across the choppy channel. When the Phoenixes reached the Normandy beach, there was a heavy sea running. The Navy tugs jockeyed their massive blocks into line. There was constant danger that the blocks would smash into each other. Dive bombers, shore batteries, and surf combined to make the operation interesting. As each Phoenix was swung into position, its crew opened the sea valves. One after another, the great blocks sank to form the giant breakwater that gradually grew out of the sea. And under its lee, the cargo vessels moved in toward the shore. But the Phoenix breakwater was only part of the gigantic Allied plan. In order to handle the hundreds of cargo vessels, the engineers had determined to build a huge artificial harbor, complete with wharves, docks, piers, and anchorages. The Phoenix breakwater formed one side of this harbor. Another fleet, manned by Navy crews, set out from England. A fleet of old ships, no longer considered serviceable, with explosive charges placed in their holds. These ships were maneuvered into a long line, like the Phoenixes. Then, at a signal, the charges were exploded. The ships sank to form an additional breakwater. A wall of ships, enough vessels to form a small merchant fleet, sunk to provide protection for their comrades bringing in supplies. Among them was the HMS Centurion, veteran of the last war and victor at Jutland, now past her prime, but still able in her death to strike again at Germany. It took only 11 days to turn this beach into a complete harbor. Meantime, the LSTs were unloading over the Navy's pontoon causeways. Here, for the first time in combat landing, the pontoon causeways were sunk to provide a more stable landing stage over the vast distance from tidewater to the beach. As the tide rose, the causeways were submerged at their outboard ends, but the exposed inboard sections could still be used. But this was a temporary expedient. The American and English engineers went right on working on more permanent docking facilities. While this was being done, across the channel came a procession of weird objects that would have interested Buck Rogers. These were the new Lobnitz pierheads invented by the British, each band by a CB towing crew. These pierheads were secured to the ends of the floating causeways. Then the four long legs at the corners of the pierhead were lowered until they struck bottom. These legs held the pierhead and the causeway steady so the ships could be unloaded. 
To keep the pier head from being covered at high tide, the platform was arranged so it could be lifted up and down on its legs. When the tide rose, the platform was raised with it. So no matter what the tides, the pier heads were able to operate 24 hours a day. The English, who weren't used to the Navy pontoons, preferred to use bridges mounted on floats, which they called whales. These whales were used to bridge the distance from Lobnitz Pierhead to shore. For ships too big to tie up to the Lobnitz Pierheads, the Navy men came through with another trick. They put upboard motors on barges made of pontoons and ran them out to the ships. These self-propelled barges, called rhinos, were probably the most useful single invention in the whole operation. During the first days of the invasion, 85% of all vehicular traffic was landed by rhinos. In two or three trips, a rhino could unload an entire LST, regardless of tide, currents, or enemy gunfire. Having about as much draft as a flounder, the rhinos could run up on the beach and unload. Some were simply beached and used as a sort of a warehouse for men needing sudden supplies. Within a few days after the first men had come ashore, more equipment and supplies were being landed on the beachhead than had ever been landed anywhere at any time in history. No harbor in the world could have handled this amount of shipping. Yet this great system of wharves and docks and breakwaters had been constructed under fire. Suddenly, in the middle of this gigantic operation, storm warnings went up. Weather experts had picked June as a good month for the landing. Unfortunately, the wind and sea hadn't read the weather reports. Before the harbor could be completed, the worst June storm in 20 years hit the coast. The huge concrete phoenixes were thrown about like children's playing blocks. For three days, it was impossible to bring ships into the harbor. When the storm had blown itself out, the harbor was a ruin. The causeways were torn up and flung on the beach. Scores of ships lay wrecked in the harbor. Immediately, repair operations were begun. On their repair barge, Can Do, which had seen service from H hours, Seabees worked steadily to repair and rebuild wrecked equipment. More supplies were landed in the first month, in spite of the storm, that had been considered possible under ideal conditions. The Seabees stayed to see the Allied armies they had helped land on the beach at Normandy drive deep into Germany itself. They saw guns, trucks, ammunition, all the supplies needed to make victory certain flow onto the continent in an ever-growing stream. Across the beaches, the Germans said, would doom any invasion. Their part in building the road to Berlin was complete. And then, with the end of Hitler's fortress Europa assured, they moved on to join their mates in the Pacific. <laughs>